Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Uh, this is another episode of uh, In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo, and I'm also known as the Urban Birder. Um, I'm really, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really quite uh, fascinated with tonight's subject uh, about citizen science because I think it's something that's close to, or should be close to everyone's heart because all of us can get involved. Um, before I talk about our guests, I just want to basically quickly say that tonight has been sponsored by Leica Nature and Birding, as well as King's Place Music Foundation, who are celebrating or actually having a, a whole year called uh, Nature and Rat, and this is part of their season. So they're sponsoring us for that. So thank you very much to those guys. And tonight, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Darlene Cavalier and Dr. Karen Cooper, um, who are both in the States, and we'll find out exactly where they are in a second. But thank you, um, ladies, for joining us tonight. Nice to be here, and you can hear a little background charter plane going overhead. And if you don't hear that, you'll hear the leaf blower from the neighbor. Just perfect timing. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me too. I was um, saying earlier, uh, Darlene, that um, I was calling you um, Darlene Cav uh, Cavalier to everyone during the past week, um, and actually it's Cavalier. So I apologize if I um, was pronouncing okay. the name wrong. Uh, and as for you, Karen, or Dr. Karen, your name has been, you know, Dr. Karen Cooper, as far as I'm concerned, unless you can tell me anything different. Hey, yeah, thanks for having, having me on here. Okay, well listen, why don't we, why don't we kind of um, find out who you both are firstly, and as I can see you, uh, Karen, Dr. Karen, actually Karen, um, can you explain, you know, what do you, who do you, you know, what do you do basically? Because I've, um, I've got some information on you, but if you can tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, I'm an associate professor at North Carolina State University. So I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, really there's, I guess, two aspects to what I do. Um, I mean, in my research, so I teach. I teach citizen science, I teach public science. Um, that is how to, how to train scientists to be more public facing in their work. And one way to do that is through citizen science and what, what all that means. Um, anyway, and in my research, uh, my background is in birds. So I spent about 15 years of my career at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that's actually where I became most acquainted with citizen science. And, uh, and using, uh, really advancing bird research and conservation through all the data that bird watchers contributed to the Cornell Lab. Um, and then I became interested in the social science side of things and actually interested in the bird watchers in citizen science, just as a phenomenon in general and what it meant for science. Anyway, and so that's still what my day-to-day -day life is like. Half the time it's about birds or environment using citizen science methods to understand ecology. And then the other half is um, really studying citizen science and the people who do it, motivations, learning, conservation behaviors, all those kinds of things. So I have this very split personality in my job. <laughs> right, love the color of your hair as well, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Very princey. Um, Darlene, um, I obviously was speaking or actually spoke of you originally um, regarding, um, well actually I must say part of the reason why you guys are here is because of this book which has come out, which um, you two are involved with, as well as um, a third author, Catherine Hoffman. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, I will talk about that shortly as well, but Darlene, um, you have a very interesting background too. I've got a few questions regarding your background, but can you quickly kind of run us through? Where to start? Yes. Um, so half of my professional life is spent as a professor of practice at Arizona State University, which is in Tempe, Arizona. Although I am based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but calling in from Long Beach Island, New Jersey. Um, and all of my work centers around public engagement in science. Most of that is around citizen science. So um, I have a different path than Karen took, although we're both kind of here together at the same intersection. 
Mine came from somebody without much interest in science for most of my adolescence, even through college, and frankly, even in my first professional job, which was um, working in, in communications that happened to be doing work for Discover Magazine, which is a popular science publication here in the United States. Um, moved my way up the ranks in the Disney executive world, Disney owned Discover Magazine, um, and just couldn't stop this nagging feeling that more could be done with people like me who don't have formal degrees in science, but who wanted to do more, who wanted to be part of this enterprise. So that um, really sparked my interest in going back to school. So I, I went to graduate school and started learning about um, people who were engaged in all forms of science for many, many different reasons. Um, but it was actually hard to find these opportunities. So I started a little database as a means to an end for my final research project paper. Um, and that database became something called SciStarter, which now has more than 3,000 projects that are registered from around the world. Um, millions of people who come to the site, 85,000 registered users who turn to SciStarter for their next opportunity to engage. That's how Karen and I cross paths. Karen studies the field of citizen science. Um, I and my team help create um, mechanisms that enable more and more people from all walks of life to discover these opportunities, stay engaged, deepen their engagement. Now, the wacky part of all this story that I left out there is I was not interested in science. I was interested in cheerleading and dance, and that's all I wanted to do. Um, so I, I danced as a young kid. I, I cheered through college. I cheered as a professional for the National Basketball Association in Philadelphia. That team is the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, you have to have a full-time job or be in school full-time while you're a professional cheerleader, little known fact. Um, so these two worlds came together in a nonprofit organization that I started called Science Cheerleaders. So these are professional cheerleaders, current and former, who are also scientists and engineers, unlike me. They're actual scientists and engineers. So we work through the science cheerleaders to help get young cheerleaders. There's 3 million of them in the United States. Cheerleading is very big over here. Yeah. Um, That's the question I want to ask you. Um, as someone living in England, um, mm -hmm. I don't understand what cheerleading is about because I see people waving pom-poms about and doing um, dance formations. Um, and they've actually kind of copied that a little bit over here as well, but it hasn't really caught on in a big way as it has in the state. Yeah. But I don't understand what kind of people do this and why do they do it? Are they supporters of a team or are they doing it for some bigger reason? Both. In all kinds of ways. Like we're, when we get into citizen science, when we get into those conversations, we're going to find out, oh my God, there's so many different reasons why people get involved in citizen science. That's not too unlike cheerleading and dance. So for cheerleading, um, sometimes it's because they're really passionate about the sport or the team. Typically, it's because it's a form of, it, it is a sport. So um, for cheerleading, you often are, it's a blend of dance and gymnastics. Um, it's a common social bond. Many cheerleaders, as I mentioned, the three million that are in the United States, the youth cheerleaders, they tend to be um, leaders in student government or very involved in their communities. What we did find is they, so I'll answer the question how I can answer it, which is why I stayed involved. My main passion was dance, ballet, tap, jazz, hip hop. And I knew by college I was not going to be, I wasn't going to devote my whole career to dance. I wasn't that good. I wasn't going to make it on Broadway. It's not really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So cheerleading allowed me to still stay engaged and physically active. And it's a lot of fun. And we had a top basketball team in the country for a while, my college, which is Temple University. So it was an amazing experience to be able to travel as part of the team. And um, I don't know, it's a really unique feeling to be on the court when you have an amazing basketball team and a whole college is rooting with you for your team to win. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, I think they were also rooting for us to fall in our pyramids because they really like seeing that <laughs> sometimes, but we'll leave that part out. Um, and then for professional cheerleading with the 76ers, it was the first time they had auditions for cheerleaders for the basketball team. And this was my senior year in college. I was kind of getting bored with cheering at college by this point. And I thought, I'm just going to, I'm going to go for it. And it's going to keep me engaged in dancing. I met a lot of great friends. And what else is little known about the professional cheerleading world is 
how much time is devoted to giving back to the community. The community events there are huge because when they can't send a player, uh, they send somebody else from the franchise. Typically, that's that's a cheerleader. So those moments felt felt really good too. So those are my reasons. Um, but what we learned through the science cheerleaders is that the skills that make somebody a good dancer or cheerleader happen to make them amazing scientists or engineers. So that's um, time management skills, that's optimism, that's um, interpersonal communications, that's teamwork, that's a sense of like, if it didn't work, let's do it again. You know, all those things make them really good scientists and engineers. So we, we like blending those two worlds and challenging stereotypes. Every appearance that a science cheerleader does, they get the girls and their families involved in a local citizen science project as a reminder to the parents who, many of whom didn't go to college. Cheerleading is big in the Bible Belt states, in the Southern states, where there's also um, issues with science education levels there too. So um, we get to talk to the parents and remind them that it's never too late to engage in science, anything they're curious or concerned about. There's a scientist that needs their help. There's a question that they can help address so we get everybody involved in the citizen science project during those events too. Okay, well, we're gonna be talking about science and how it's perceived in the States uh, a bit later, but one more question for you, Darlene, Darlene which is basically, um, how did you, when you first started this, this science cheerleader thing, how did you kind of identify who's into science and who's not? Was it something you put out like a memo or something, or how did you kind of locate people? Well, when, when I was in graduate school and I realized that it was so difficult to find these opportunities, like it shouldn't have taken me leaving my job at Disney and going to school full time to discover ways that I couldn't engage in science. If there had been a size starter for me when I was working at Disney, I wouldn't have stopped to go to graduate school. It was that difficult to understand like, there's gotta be more that I can do, even though I'm probably never going to become a scientist or a policymaker got to be other ways that I can engage. Um, and I just want to, I want to reiterate that point because so many STEM outreach projects, including the ones that I created while at Disney, have this undertone or this undercurrent that they're designed for little kids who should want to grow up to become scientists. And the moment that's the message, that's when you lose all of the Darlene's in the world who are focused on something else or are not really focused on their professional careers too easy to tune out to that message and it happens too much. So I started thinking about all the other people who were probably in my position of like, hey, I have time now, I have new interests, I've been exposed to something. Other people may have been, um, their interests may be because they have an illness themselves or a family member who's sick and suddenly they're now paying attention to medical literature in ways they hadn't before. Everybody has their reason for connecting back to science at some point. So to answer your question, when I was in graduate school and I was looking for these opportunities, when I put this database of opportunities together, I started a blog called Science Cheerleader, uh, just to play off my own background. And I was asking friends and family, do you know of, first of all, do you want to get involved in any of these projects? You know, here's a growing list. Maybe I had a dozen in there, some from Cornell, some from other sites. Um, and if you know of other types of projects that you're involved in, can you let me know? So this database started to expand, but it was still slow. It was still like, you know, not many people coming to check out that blog. When I would get very large amounts of traffic was when um, I would, I actually worked with the 76ers cheerleaders to do some fun videos. And, you know, they each said something about citizen science and we had little quizzes up and that was weird enough for people to share it on social media. And it was, unintentionally provocative enough to make people either happy or sad or really mad. <laughs> so, you know, there's the objectification of the cheerleaders, which didn't sit well with many people and I totally get it. Um, so whenever I would interview a cheerleader who also was a PhD, had a PhD in chemical engineering, that does not compute in the heads that easily. So it sparked conversation, it sparked lots of social media attraction. And I needed a way to quickly go from that to, and here's what you can do. It's one thing to read about them and listen to them, but here's things they're asking you to engage in. So it was a great way, and still continues to be a great way, to cast a wide net. Maybe somebody's just interested in the 76ers, and that's how they came about that story. Now they know there's opportunities for them in Philadelphia to engage in science that needs their help. 
So cast a wide net, get them involved in these citizen science projects. And where we're trying to still push that envelope, there just are not enough of these opportunities. I would call, call, call this phase three. These are more in policy related forums, participatory technology assessments. When there's a question that scientists alone can't answer because of the societal implications or the economic implications and where um, members of the community can come together, become informed on a topic and actually weigh in in a, in a way that matters. Um, those for, for shorthand, we'll call them public forums. So in an ideal world, I imagine we'd cast a wide net We'd move them to citizen science. We'd identify the topics that they're interested in and the experiences that they picked up there and they'd be primed for these kind of heavier lift versions. But I don't know that that's actually the flow. This is something that Karen and I and others study now is the movement and the behavior of people. Maybe it's that they come in through those heavy lifts and work their way down or work their way around or over or across to citizen science and other ways of learning. It's fascinating because I did actually see a couple of clips um, on YouTube where you were speaking to cheerleaders and, you know, they were saying I'm a chemical engineer and stuff. And I was thinking, you know, I was quite surprised. Um, no disrespect, of course, but you just right. didn't expect uh, these, these women to have such uh, interesting careers. Um, Karen, can I bring you in um, now, actually? Um, I like the, I'm interested in, in the fact that you, um, you actually study the people, the scientists, as well as the actual um, uh, citizen scientists. Um, you spoke about public facing. Um, I presume you're talking about things like public speaking, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that, that as well. Um, <clears throat> I think with a lot of, um, I think more and more scientists are recognizing uh, the need for good public engagement in science which includes science communication, whether it's written or speaking or you know, making videos or graphic novels, like whatever it might be, ways to communicate science with the public or to engage the public in science, like with citizen science. Yeah, so I'm in a program here that's called Leadership in Public Science, and it spans all of that, science communication, citizen science, and also sort of open science and those kind of practices. Just any ways to, um, I mean, it's really, I guess, in, in many ways, it's all, there, I mean, one sort of goal of that relates to increasing science literacy and trust in science. If people are involved in the process. Um, hopefully it could build more trust, <laughs> build more of a common understanding um, of the phenomena that's being studied. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of how this public science aspect comes in. Yeah, I love and, Sorry, oh, Carol, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to add, like, but I came at it from such a different way than Darlene, um, because I did come at it from the scientist's perspective. And it was really um, after studying in school, um, you know, getting a master's and a PhD and, you know, working on different projects, always at like one study site, trying to get as much data as possible with, you know, me and my field technician, um, and always getting these really small sample sizes and making small inferences relative to that study site. That when I learned about citizen science data, and it was with bird watchers at first, and like, I mean, huge amounts of observations. <laughs> like, it was just so amazing, like the research questions that could be asked with citizen science that, that a scientist alone could never, ever ask or address. And, uh, and so that crowdsourcing aspect of um, having data over decades, having data over the con across the continent was just, for me, was like just fascinating and amazing. Huge opportunities, both for research and for conservation. Fantastic, are you, si are you sitting on a rocking chair on your porch? Oh yeah, am I moving a bit? <laughs> I am on my porch. And I can show you that I'm a citizen scientist too. I don't know if you, can you see this device back here? Yeah, what is it? That is, it's, a, it's called a purple air sensor. It's an air quality monitor that uh, NASA, uh, that I got from NASA when I enrolled in one of their citizen science projects. So it, it, uh, it streams live to the internet, uh, PM 2.5, like a particulate matter, a certain type of particulate matter related to pollution. Yeah. Just pointing out that I also am a citizen scientist. You know, I'm interested, uh, just go back again with the scientists and the public facing thing because you know, when you, 
I guess maybe less so now, but certainly um, you've always, you always had a vision in your mind when someone was a scientist wearing a white coat, you know, who cannot talk to anyone other than someone that he's, he or her uh, peer, peers even, you know, they, they can't talk to anyone else basically. They've got difficulty communicating with a lay person. Um, and I've worked in situations like that. I've worked for a couple of, well, actually one NGO in the past um, where it was very scientifically led. And I think it's such an important thing for, 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 for those people to learn because um, there was an, an instance a few years ago when a, a very popular magazine um, here, Wildlife Magazine in the UK, um, put out a, uh, a series of um, articles about, well, basically aimed at getting young people involved in the conservation world. So how to be an oceanographer, how to be a, you know, a, a warden in the nature reserve, all these things, which is great. But I noticed that I didn't have anything about public speaking. And I wrote to them and I said, you know, I noticed you haven't got anything about that. And they said, well, we didn't think it was important. And I said, well, that's interesting because there's a, 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 an orator I know who's really, really amazing. You might know him as well. His name's David Attenborough. <laughs> I, I believe I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> important to, to, for people to actually be able to relay what they are trying to, uh, to research to the layperson because they're the very people that they need the support from, surely. Right, yeah, I mean, most scientists still are taught, uh, you do the research and you make a peer-reviewed publication and then you're done. You, you know, that, that's like as though it ends there, uh, as though it's magically gonna have some kind of impact when three other scientists read that paper. <laughs> so yeah, there's a culture shift needed to really um, expand the responsibilities that scientists have to include communication. And it doesn't have, to, I mean, I like to emphasize actually to my students that it doesn't have to be public speaking per se. There's a lot of forms of communication it can be. I, like I personally am way more comfortable writing and blogging than you know, necessarily speaking. Um, so it's really just a matter of finding what's right, the right way to extend one's uh, impact. Is there a certain scientist type then? Do you think that scientists, can you spot a scientist in the crowd, put it that way? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of efforts. Uh, you've probably seen the, the um, social media, whatever, this is what a scientist look like, looks like. There's t-shirts, it's a hashtag. Certainly efforts to dispel those myths. For, for decades, there were these draw scientists kind of um, uh, surveys with kids. And, and for decades, they always drew just what you described, like a white male in a lab coat doing something a little bit dangerous, like with radioactivity or something or chemistry. Uh, and only recently has that changed where it's, some kids will draw women in lab coats. <laughs> but it's still like this very narrow, I mean, they're drawing a stereotype. Um, but anyway, but, there, but there, I remember a few years ago, there was a study of climate change scientists and it was, and of the general public and it was looking at, it had them take a personality test, one of those like Myers-Briggs or one of those really common ones. And they were definitely, <laughs> this group of scientists were definitely like, came out as different personality types than the general public. You know, which shouldn't, <laughs> it speaks to this problem, I guess problem we could say of like, who feels like science is accessible to them. And it really shouldn't be based on your personality type, right? Uh, it should be something available to everyone, whether it's through citizen science or a career. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know. It's certainly meant, met a, a large variety of scientists and many are quite social. <laughs> you also, I mean, what I also found interesting about what you said earlier was um, the fact you study birders as a phenomenon as well. Now, tell me about the birders. I'm really interested in that because at the moment in the UK, we're having a real, I don't know, there's certain sections of the birding community have been hounded at the moment, rightly or wrongly, um, for how they come across. So before I tell you more about that, tell us more about the, the typical or at atypical uh, birder in, in North America. <laughs> huh. I'm, I wonder if you're talking about twitchers. Um, <laughs> So yeah, my first, the first study I did that was like social science oriented was, it started because I was with a, 
actually a friend from the UK, well, a colleague who I met in person for the first time at a conference, an ornithology conference. And uh, <laughs> she said, uh, <laughs> how did it go? She was, she was young, she wanted to meet guys. And, and instead of saying, let's go to a bar, she goes, let's go birding. <laughs> like, like, oh, cause it's all, it's gonna be all men and uh, she'll meet people, whatever. It was just kind of funny. You see, now I've identified her. Cause I'm about to say, then we published a paper later. So then we studied bird watchers in the US and in the UK and just looking at gender dynamics at first. And it was just interesting. Cause what we saw was that there's like the bird watchers or what might fit into that category where like women, non-competitive watching, you know, at their feeders or around their house. And then there was this spectrum to like highly competitive twitchers or birders that like were all about how long their checklist could be and uh, seeing, you know, rare things. Like it was just a very different, you know, they did the big day competitions and stuff like that. And we saw that reflected in the types of citizen science projects. Um, and it was just kind of a weird, like we weren't putting any judgment on it. It was just kind of weird, like just to point out that there are these differences and that like structuring a citizen science project, for example, or a birding event to be competitive might dissuade, you know, might only attract certain segments of the population, um, you know, and designing it a different way might appeal to other types of people. So uh, anyway, that, that's where things started. And then I started looking more details at in citizen science and using the SciStarter platform for seeing even beyond bird watchers, just people doing all kinds of projects, butterflies, weather, stars, you know, all kinds of things. I want to talk to Darlene about the uh, size starters, but let me quickly ask you another question in terms of the, was there a difference between the birders in the US and the UK? Oh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. <laughs> Were there differences, did you ask, between the US and the UK? Well, was there a difference between, the, the, it, you know, the birders in the US or North America versus the birders, well, not even versus, but compared to the well, birders in the UK? The, the gender patterns we found were even more extreme in the UK for the data sets that we had. More males. For the top bird, like for anything that remotely seemed competitive to get into. Yeah, because of what I, was, what I was referring to earlier is the fact that, you know, with the, the Black Lives Matter, stuff that happened recently, I mean, when I say stuff, it's been happening all the time and, you know, tragic and what have you. There's been a lot of, um, and, well, before then as well, but certainly during that period, a lot of finger pointing at um, a wide range of white, male, middle-aged, um, middle-class birders in the UK, insinuating that they were racist. Um, and it was like kind of very strange for me because I, a couple of my friends have come to me and said that we feel really upset by this because we feel that we've been sort of typecast, as it were, uh, as being in this, this, this grouping. So I just wondered, had there, is there something like that happening in the U.S. as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so two of my graduate students who are ornithology grad students um, are, are black. And so they, they were part of this move this movement like this hashtag it was really a social media movement i guess of black birders week right Cause, and uh and i think i mean i saw it as like a really positive and uh innovative way to have a conversation about racism uh and access to nature and access to science through this uh really through hearing the voices of black birders so that was a really, I mean, that was a big thing here. Was that hashtag big in the UK? That was, Black yeah. Birders Week? Even though there wasn't many black birders. Oh, okay. Or in the States. Um, There's very few. Are you asking if, if there are many? Or not as many, you're saying? There's, as there's in, very few. Yeah. Um, few. And it, it, was, it was a big event here. It had a lot of people. And it... Uh, there was other related events uh, like Black in Nature. I think there was a like a uh, Black in Botany or something like that. There was a plant one. Just different different uh, conservation fields that uh, kind of were uh, followed suit in sort of raising the voices of people of color of Black people in particular because of the. 
I mean, it was initially sparked with Christian Cooper's incident with Amy Cooper, and I'm not related to either Cooper, but anyway, it was that event that sparked a lot of a lot of what followed. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of awareness that was raised here in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, I think there's more to come with that movement as well. Absolutely. And for those who don't know, the the incident um, that Karen's talking about happened in uh, in Central Park when. Um, he politely asked, i.e. Christian Cooper, a black birder, asked uh, a, a white lady, it was just a lady as far as he was concerned, to put her dog on a leash and then she responded by trying to call the police on him and saying that he was being, she was being threatened, which was pretty bad. Darlene, um, if I can come to you, um, I've got a question here from uh, one of our Zoomers, Dennis Reardon, maybe you can have a look at this question. Um, has any of your research involved the engagement of black and Hispanic young people in citizen or community science? Increasingly, and this is an area that Karen is zeroing in on too, and Karen, you might want to talk about Crowd the Tap um, here, but some ways that SciStarter helps in my work and the SciStarter team, which I see Jill Nugent is on, she's part of the SciStarter team, hey Jill, um, is to help facilitate um, connections to and support for the people who have the um, connections to communities. So for example, we do a lot of work with the Girl Scouts here. The Girl Scouts understand the councils and the troops within those councils and understand the demographic makeup. So we don't necessarily have a means to reach specific target audiences. We, we can, but we can say with certainty that when we partner up with groups that are already supporting different communities, we help bring citizen science, we work with them to make sure that, and the Girl Scouts is a great example of this, that the language is accurate and correct. They know their audience really well. Um, we provide additional support also for the trainers, so the troop leaders in that case. Imagine um, a teacher, a, um, I already said troop leader, a librarian, a museum professional. This, this I wanna also get on, it touches on the question about that you were just discussing with Karen about scientists as communicators. It would be great if more were comfortable communicating, but we know that many aren't. But we do have this role of people who have direct access to their communities. And so empowering and supporting them as science communicators, especially when it comes to citizen science, has been very effective. So national programs with the Girl Scouts over here. Um, and I'm going to Maybe Karen, are we are we at liberty to talk about any of the work with Sokovi or anything else? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe till it's fine. You know, till pens on paper. <laughs> There's things in the pipeline. <laughs> I mean, really talk in general. Pipeline. But why don't you talk about? Um, oh, and, and the other. So I mentioned Girl Scouts. The other work that we do spend a lot of time on at SciStarter and Arizona State University is with public libraries. So this is another facilitator of community connections to people that are may otherwise be hard to reach because the library is their source of Wi-Fi. The library is their source. I'm, I'm sweating like a pig out here because my family's so loud inside the house. But in Arizona, it's unbelievably hot and the libraries provide air conditioning for people. They provide access to um, computers. So we're training librarians and other community members on how to engage people in citizen science and how to host community dialogues so we can get wiser about issues that matter to them. And we do, um, you know, a lot of um, circular feedback. So we can also understand how to improve the design of some of the projects. Um, great example might be we loan equipment through libraries. And in, that, in those kits that people check out for free, there are additional reading, there are um, printed guides. You know, it takes all the work out that they, if they don't have a printer, or they don't have Wi-Fi, that they can still engage in citizen science this way. And there's a little journal that they can write in when they return the kit. And it's great to get feedback just there of, hey, we didn't, you know, have you thought about doing this? Like that feedback from a person who's actually done the project is super helpful. The, the project leader, the scientist, may or may not ever actually change the design of their project, but as people who are facilitating those connections and creating the ligaments, 
we actually are able to change the design of the project specified for the community that's actually doing the project. So this is more like the implementation, the design of the implementation that we spend a lot of time on at SciStarter. So this is something that we're increasingly doing and I wish we could talk about some of the work that we have in the wraps, uh, on the wraps, but I do think maybe you should talk about Crowd the Tap. Before, oh. before Karen does, can you just quickly just outline what SciStarter is? I know you've mentioned it a few times. Can you just define what it is? Sure. SciStarter uh, is very surface, is a place where we connect people who may be curious or concerned about a topic to ways that they can engage in um, citizen science that advances research on that topic. And it's also where scientists or project leaders, sometimes they're members of the community, typically they're um, a scientist, can um, recruit people for their project. So it's a matchmaking site on the surface. But then we have all these collaborations with the Girl Scouts. So the Girl Scouts come and they see a completely different view of SciStarter. That view of SciStarter doesn't have them searching through 3,000 projects to find. It has them searching through a handful of projects that were selected and curated based on criteria that the Girl Scouts have for a think like a citizen scientist batch. It has step-by-step -step instructions. It has videos of the project scientists talking to them. It has reflection documents. It has prompts on how they can take action from there. There's a lot. And then that gets researched by Karen and her colleagues. They, um, they start to learn more about like, how are the Girl Scouts as a facilitated group of people coming into us different than other types of citizen scientists who may have just found out about SciStarter because of an interview like this, or they read about it on Discover Magazine. So what's the role of a facilitated experience there? We do similar things with corporate volunteer programs like Verizon. Verizon uses SciStarter as a platform for their employees to earn volunteer credit hours. And they do it through citizen science projects on SciStarter. Again, we work with um, libraries across the country to um, provide resources and training for librarians so that libraries can start to become community hubs for citizen science, accessible community hubs for citizen science. And there's another, we work with senior citizens groups. I mean, this has become really important. They were one of the other primary users of libraries. With COVID, libraries are either shut or citizen scientists are not gathering in public, I mean, senior citizens are not as comfortable gathering in these social arenas like they used to. So we're developing more kind of low-key online programs to keep them engaged. And they turn out to be amazing citizen scientists too. So the goal at SciStarter is also to, to find ways to make it possible for people from not only all walks of life, but at all these different spheres of your life. We all know that we change. We're different. I'm so different than I was at 17 or 18 years old. I'm also very different than I was even 10 years ago. Times of my life, I have more time to volunteer and engage or get involved in projects like this. Other times of my life, I don't. Circumstances change, so we have these different on-ramps for people at different stages of life to hop in and hop out, and we just support them in their, you know, in their journey with citizen science. Sometimes called community science, as was noted by Dennis. Karen may want to talk about, I don't know, it could be a rabbit hole, but we see, we see a very uh, clear distinction sometimes between citizen science as a defined term and community science, mainly because community science is a field of study uh, where a community member tends to drive the research agenda. And that's, that's what we call like bottom-up community science happening there. A lot of citizen science is not community science. You're on your own. You do it independently. Even though a million of you are advancing an area of science, doesn't really feel like you're part of a community when you're doing many of the citizen science projects. And there's a whole spectrum of opportunities in between those two. Yeah, and for those interested, the citizen, the, sorry, the um, size starter uh, website is actually written in the chat. So Karen, so we, we're going to come in with uh, uh, <laughs> to answer Darlene's request. Yeah, well, I'll just uh, say further that whenever I speak about citizen science, like a question that I always get is how can I get started? And so, I mean, uh, SciStarter.org really is that hub of, of, it's where I always send people to just get started because it's got 
you know, whatever people need to find. So yeah, it's, it's a great hub for that. I, I forgot our own tagline. It, we're the, we take the starter and size starter seriously. I forget to always say that. that there you go. <laughs> is that the tagline? Okay. Anyway, it really is about starting. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about Dennis's question with, with citizen or community science, because like Darlene was saying, uh, I mean, so these terms are evolving all the time. And in the US, there's some uh, concern about the term citizen, because here it's so political. It has a lot, you know, there's so much, there's disparities based on citizenship status in the US. And so it can seem, the problem with it potentially being, having people feel excluded. But, but in another level, uh, like what Darlene was saying is community science means to many of us, it means sci uh, a project that's really driven by the community members locally in a place to, to meet the needs of that community, as opposed to citizen science, which often refers to these much larger crowdsourcing projects driven maybe by a university or an NGO that, um, that do serve needs too, but not specific to that one location necessarily, but just to that common interest. And so, um, uh, well, and Dennis's question was asking about engagement of Black and Hispanic people in citizen or community science. And it does seem like there's a difference in uh, um, people of color in community science, in these local projects where there's really a need for science to serve that community. Um, and citizen science, these larger projects, having predominantly white and highly educated participants. And so, yeah, I mean, we are studying that and, and thinking about ways where, where we can design projects to better serve communities so that they could have, uh, they can better serve more people. Um, okay. Now, a question for both of you. Um, you are currently, um, well, let me say this, um, politically correctly, you have an administration at the moment who doesn't seem to have much belief, faith, understanding of science. How is that affecting, you know, the work that you're trying to do, the people you're trying to encourage? Um, how, how, how is that, this is for both of you, how, how is that affecting things? Do you want me to, I can, I mean, citizen science is definitely nonpartisan. <laughs> Right? I mean, it itself certainly um, isn't related to political affiliation. Um, and I think, well, it's my, I don't know if this is a tangent. For me, one of the things that I really like about science and when people learn about science are the critical thinking skills that go with it. And it, in some ways, it's very analogous to media literacy. So I think a lot of what, what, some of the struggles in this country relate not just to disparaging about science, but also a need for science literacy and media literacy. It's all about how people get information and can tell sort of what's true and what's not. And, and there's science ways of doing that, and there's, but so much is filtered through media. So there's just, I guess I'm just saying, there's, there's a need for both kinds of literacy. <laughs> and uh, anyway, that's where I see overlap um, in that kind of engagement but I'll let Darlene go. And yes, there's uh, birds. There's definitely, and I'll, I'll let you know in a sec. I'll put in the chat what there is. <laughs> I, I could say like what we've seen with citizen science is even when we had a different president, um, if, you, if what you're experiencing in your backyard or in your community doesn't match what you see your city or your county or your state, building policy around, there's going to be a lack of trust. And sometimes that's because that sensor that Karen has in the background there is because the EPA does not have enough regulatory grade sensors to place all around the community. This purple air is perfect because it gives enough micro data to tell a story and to start to pick up patterns where then, in this case, it's, it's NASA doing that one, so they're probably ma mapping its satellite data. But the work that we've done with Purple Air, it, it was actually welcomed by the EPA. They just don't have the sensors to put out everywhere. So citizen science helps fill gaps. 
at a local level. And let's face it, that's what you care about. There could be federal policies. You can have a clown as the president and nobody wants that. But at a local level is where it's going to affect you. So when you don't have data that's accurately portraying what's happening to you, to your drinking water, to your soil quality, to your air quality, then you could have the best administrative administration in the world and it's still gonna be a problem for you. So citizen science and the tools that we loan out through libraries and the programs that we share and the training that we do collectively really are designed to help empower people to first of all, become aware of these opportunities for them to engage in science that needs them, but in a way that's going to make an impact locally. Um, to become comfortable with protocols, even just the language of protocols, even just the definition of what a protocol is, can be new to somebody. So easing them into that of, don't, you know, don't worry, we're going to provide you with a, a standard set of instructions. Um, building confidence that unless they intentionally go about trying to ruin the data, they're, they're probably not gonna screw up a data set. There's a lot of checks and balances that citizen science projects put in. Sometimes you need to have 10 people say the same exact thing about the same exact observation before it's considered um, you know, usable or credible data, for example. So we walk them through these steps so they feel comfortable and empowered. And then hopefully, as Karen was saying, like the literacy part of it, um, sorry about that, let me turn this off. The literacy part of it can also be citizen science and data literacy of understanding how your little data point from your backyard or your corner of the world helps tell a story when it's put in context to other data points. You see this in ecology, you see this in climate change. It's neat to watch that, those connections be made. So it's not, it's not ignoring what's happening right now in our country at all in any way, shape or form. But it is a reminder that no matter what's happening at that level, this is happening to you right here and people may not have that data to be able to help you, help be part of the solution, at least share your observations, open up your eyes, make the observations, learn how to share that data with other people who are in a position to actually take action on that data too. Great, that's a great answer. Um, Zoomers, um, you've been very quiet this evening. Um, anyone uh, with any questions so far? Okay, well, I will continue. Um, in terms of the citizen science work that you're doing in the States, how does that relate to, for example, somewhere like the UK? Do you look at the UK and think, ah, what needs to be done there? Do you think, ah, it's a different way of doing things? I mean, how, how does it compare? There is a different way of doing things. And it's nice because we have a citizen science association here in the United States. Karen and I, Karen, are you still on the board? I was on the board, Karen, you know, we rotate on my turn as well. Okay. Um, so it's nice because they collaborate well with the European Citizen Science Association, Australian Citizen Science Association. There's a number of associations. So we all kind of share best practices and so forth. I would say, at least when I was on the board, so this is going back a couple of years, I found an interesting distinction with then UK was part of the European Citizen Science Association. Um, maybe it still is, no. but I found it really interesting that the connection between science policy and citizen science was made right from the start in the European model, where in the United States, it's really not. You kind of dance around that issue a lot. It's about the science and the credibility and the validity of the actual research and can the data be trusted. It was more like convincing science and federal agencies that this is credible and this is, and then hoping maybe it has some kind of um, effect on the policy. So I think that might still be the case, but Karen, you wanna Yeah, I think in? it is like in, in Europe, uh, a, such a big emphasis is on um, citizen science to help inform um, as, a, as a mechanism for monitoring the sustainable development goals, right? The UN's uh, sustainable development goals which is just barely on the radar in the US. And, and I noticed that too, yeah. So a lot of policy, either at the national level or UN driven, um, informing citizen science and much more likely to have it be co-created um, 
in its design in in the UK, I feel like, and in Europe than in the US. So yeah, I do think it's a bit different. Yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, Shailesh Patel just asked a question, and that is, you know, do you need a degree? Well, that's the whole idea behind the citizen science. Anyone, absolutely anyone from any walk of life can be involved. Uh, I was looking through your book, and I was saying earlier, um, this actual interview isn't about promoting books, by the way, because I, I, I was actually uh, approached by your publisher, and I just found the subject matter really interested, and I, I just wanted to know if you guys would be up for having a chat, and I'm so glad that you were. But there's so, it's actually packed with so many different types of uh, citizens. <laughs> <laughs> citizen science um, projects to get involved with. Um, some of them I think to myself, you know, I wonder if there's, if there's the, uh, the equivalent in the UK. I mean, the shark sightings database, well, I mean, there are sharks in the UK waters. I'm not sure if there is such a thing that goes on, but there is such a wide variety. So I guess, um, do you think that what kind of convincing do people need to become a citizen scientist? Do you think that people sometimes think to themselves, you know what, I don't feel as if I'm qualified. Um, I don't know enough about this. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I'll make a mistake. Is that something that comes across a lot in terms of a... Yes, yeah. I'm, gonna jump, I'm gonna jump in here because there's a couple of things that happen there. Thank you also for holding up the book. Oh, um, yeah. And by, by the way, the projects in, on SciStarter, it's a global repository. So we actually import from Australia, like it, you'll find projects that you can do in the UK, anywhere in the world, you're going to find projects there. But some of the barriers that exist, one is because of something I spoke about earlier, at least here in the United States, because so many messages about science have been you know, STEM education and why you should be a scientist. They're aimed at kids. So many of these STEM programs are aimed at kids. As if adults don't matter. If you didn't become a scientist and you're not an educator, then you don't really need to listen to our message until we need you to fund what we're working on and until we need you to vote the way we need you to vote. And that's a big, that's a big problem in everything that we're talking about right now. It's the fact that so many adults have been excluded from science and and it's, it's wrong, it's really messed up. So one of the things when we're at a live event talking about citizen science, most of our time isn't just convincing people that you know, they're entitled, they're welcome, they're capable to do these projects. It's their very first comment and probably five minutes into any conversation is, oh wow, that sounds really cool. I'm gonna share that with my daughter's science teacher. That's really neat. My niece is gonna love this. We have been so conditioned to hear science and engagement and assume it's for kids. We redesigned our entire website to get rid of a cute little robot and bird that we had anything that made people think like we were for kids. We redesigned it. Now it's a little bit too much the other way. It's a little too, a little too academic and we're pulling back a bit. But this idea that science is not for you. Sorry, you missed your boat it's for kids, is a big problem in the United States and probably elsewhere too. Sorry. Do you want to add anything, Karen? Karen? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I'll second that. I forgot the original question, but I was looking here at the, okay, that's cool we'll, that a lot of people on this call have done. Yeah, we're going, to talk about that. we're going to talk about that shortly. Um, I'll tell you what, because we're coming up to the hour, um, let me um, ask you both something very difficult to answer. You're going to have to think about this very, very carefully. And as I can see you, Karen, you're first. Okay. Karen, okay. You ready? In your rocking chair in your, on your porch? I think. Mm -hmm. what, yes. What's your favorite bird? Ah, my favorite bird. Well, so for me, I have a soft spot for the Eastern bluebird. It's a, uh, it's one that, and I think it's, well, it's super pretty. I mean, the blue is like unbelievably pretty. And, uh, and they just take readily to nest boxes. So they're just, they're so easy to have around. And, um, 
And I spent so much of my early career studying bluebirds without ever seeing them because we have a big, ooh, thank you, yeah. So we have a big, and it yeah, does a nice job of capturing the blue, but it's kind of, <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, um, anyway, so I spent so many years studying them from afar, just of people who are enthusiastic about bluebirds, share data about them in the US. And uh, anyway, but so now I have a soft spot for those. Okay, Darlene, same question. Well, as I mentioned, we're in um, Long Beach Island, which is an actual island, 18 mile island off the coast of New Jersey. So Wait. technically we're still in New Jersey. <laughs> is um, Cardinals. Cardinals are, they're loud. They're so playful. We're learning a lot about them. And this is my whole family that's, that's quarantined here who didn't really seem to take an interest in nature or my work that much before. All of a sudden we're becoming observers. So it's been fun to do and watch. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, Darlene, uh, notwithstanding the uh, current unfortunate pandemic, where would you be right now? I would, I would be here. I like being, you know, locked down with my family. I wish I could, you know, I wish I could spend time with my mom and others that are high risk who can't be with us. And um, we're missing one family member who went to Costa Rica for spring break and to do part of her research for her final year of college in March and is still there. So it'd be nice to have my daughter with us, but I, I really love Long Beach Island. It's got a little bit of everything. I'm happy here. Good. I hope I get to meet you in person and everybody else that's on the screen now someday. Well, let's hope. Uh, um, Karen, same question. I don't want to repeat it for you. Sorry about that. Yeah. I wouldn't mind visiting Darlene's daughter in Costa Rica, but I guess I would say, actually, I'd really just like to be up in the mountains of North Carolina, just where it's about five degrees or so cooler, <laughs> just in the woods. Uh, yeah, that's my preferred place. Cool, okay. Well, we come to the point where I will thank you both so much for gracing us with your presence tonight. Uh, it's been really interesting talking about citizen science, a subject that we don't actually talk about that much as an as a, as a overall subject. We may talk about elements, i.e. The, the bits of work we're doing or you know, whatever science we're actually contributing to, but not the whole thing. So it's really interesting to talk about that. So thank you both for your time this afternoon in America. Okay. I'll, I'll yeah, well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, and thank you also to the, um, the Zoomers out there. Just to quickly let you know that tomorrow we've got Lev Perikian, Perikian who is, um, who's written a book actually about how do we actually experience the natural world. So he's going to be talking about that. Um, on Thursday, we've got Robert Oates talking about getting senior birders traveling. Um, just to remind you, but Wednesday was supposed to be Polly Morgan, the artist, but unfortunately she can't make it. She's, she's uh, just have to pull out, so we're gonna have her again another time. On Sunday the 26th, we've got a guy called David Lindo, whoever he is, um, talking about Extra Madura in Spain. And then um, on Monday the 27th, we've got a guy called Doug Tallamy, who's also an, a fellow American, and he's gonna talk about his vision for a grassroots approach to conservation. And on Thursday, the 30th of July, we have um, Dominic Cousins, who's a very well-known writer in the UK, natural history writer um, and tour leader. And he'll be talking about garden birds, British garden birds. So that's what's coming up on In Conservation With um, until the end of July. And we're gonna take a break after that, by the way, and come back again, um, firing from all cylinders in uh, October, I believe. So once again, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Really appreciate it. Look after yourselves during these troubled times. And don't forget to keep looking up. <laughs>